Good morning. Good morning. Happy November 15th. For those few of you who decided to come today, glad to see you, glad you made it here. We're going to start out with a scripture reading. Find that on the back of your bulletin. I'll invite you to stand with me. As you can see, we'll read this responsively. I'll begin with the black print and have you follow with the red print. From Isaiah 46, 1 through 4 and 8 through 13. Bell bows down, Nebo stoops, their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things you carry are borne as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together, they cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. Our first hymn this morning, O Father, You Are Sovereign, you'll find that on the blue insert in your bulletin, also on the screen behind me. O Father, You Are Sovereign.
singing. Our next hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness. I invite you to remain standing with me as we sing this. Great is Thy Faithfulness. seated. Well, we are, of course, so grateful that you have made plans to join us for our service this morning. We are a little bit below our usual numbers, but I think we understand why that is. Um, and if any of our congregation end up watching this service later on the internet, I want you to know that we, as your leaders at this church and your fellow members, we miss you. We're praying for you. Uh, we appreciate you. We are a family. We are a body, even though we aren't all able to be together at this unique time. And so uh, we trust that the Lord will continue to guide and direct our congregation and our leaders as we make decisions from one month to the next about what the Lord would have us to do, given the larger situation surrounding us with the growing number of COVID cases. Uh, some of you may be interested to know that we are not planning to have our usual Thanksgiving uh, communion meal. We are going to, of course, continue to have communion on that, that evening, but we do want to make sure that we're not pushing, pushing the limits of what seems reasonable given the circumstances we find ourselves in. So as you're making your plans for Thanksgiving, I'm sure many of you are considering whether or not to do the things you're used to doing 
Um, Lord willing, we'll have an opportunity to do what we're used to doing next year, but we'll be altering things a little bit for this year given the situation that we find ourselves in. You may also have noticed that there is a, an extra note in your bulletin about the updated child protection policy. Of course, it feels like it's been many weeks ago that we had our, our business meeting where we discussed that proposed policy. And we took that back after some input from you as a congregation. We made some changes, and those changes should be highlighted in yellow. So if you read it before uh, and you want to see what changes have been made, all you should have to do is glance through that, and you should see the kinds of changes that have been introduced. And then our plan is, Lord willing, to discuss that together again at a congregational meeting that will take place on Sunday, December 6th. So be sure to take a look at that as you have opportunity. We are continuing to pray this morning for Anne and Carrie, who are, of course, uh, recovering from COVID. Carrie sent me a text this morning, said they had just about every symptom except the shortness of breath, um, and they're grateful for that, but it, of course, hasn't been a fun experience, as it often is not. Um, so I'm sure that they would appreciate your prayers, and let's continue to uphold one another, asking that the Lord would protect our congregation, and let's ask that the Lord would be merciful to our nation as we try to handle this pandemic in a way that is responsible uh, and in a way that ultimately doesn't make the problem worse. Um, certainly our leaders are in great need of wisdom to be able to do that. We've been, of course, praying for Cindy Lundberg the last several weeks, and the last information that I had regarding her actually seemed more hopeful than what we've been hearing. Um, there's some signs that her internal organs are beginning to function again, so that is a huge answer to prayer. Thank you so much for your prayers for Cindy. I know that she and the family certainly do appreciate that. Let's continue to pray that uh, the Lord would raise her up, that he would strengthen her, and that he would give the doctors wisdom. Um, I've also uh, received a request that we would pray for Jack Bellware. I think that's uh, the name. This is a friend of the Wassums, and he has COVID currently, and apparently he's not doing well. So we want to remember him in prayer this morning. And of course, um, we are grateful to hear that uh, Daryl Bolter seemed to come through his ear surgery well. Um, don't necessarily know what the long-term impact of that is going to be yet. We're still waiting to hear about that, but we're grateful for what appears to have been a good surgery this last Friday. And let's do also be in prayer for uh, the Calgers and their family. John's father, of course, passed away last week. And in some ways, that's an answer to prayer, but it is still of course, uh, a sad thing, and so we want to pray for grace for the family and for, for the Lord to work through what is um, a circumstance that leaves people with tender hearts. We want the Lord to work through that, so we'll be praying for that as well this morning. We're praying for our missionary, missionaries, Jeremy and Carolyn Dion. They are our missionaries in Papua New Guinea, and they are currently stateside. They're making plans to return to PNG, and they've asked that we would pray for the issue with Jeremy's hand. Of course, you'll recall that he had a severe injury to his hand um, and he is recovering from that, but the scar tissue is making some of the motion, um, uh, regaining that motion of the hand difficult. Um, and then we're also praying for Jeremy as he's discipling a man named Michael uh, in PNG. And then we're also praising the Lord for the birth of their fourth child, who we got an early introduction to um, on a Wednesday evening service, uh, thanks to a misprint in our, in our prayer reminder. This is Hudson Lee, who was born in October. So we're praising the Lord for his grace uh, for this family and the birth of their fourth child. Well, with that, I'll invite you to join with me as we go before the Lord in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful this morning that you are a God who is completely sovereign. You rule and you reign over all. There is nothing that happens in this world apart from your plan, apart from your sovereign will. And we know that that doesn't mean that there aren't things that happen in this world that are displeasing to you. Um, on a moral level, because you are a perfectly holy and righteous God, and you cannot tolerate uh, or overlook sin. But at the same time, Lord, your word teaches us that you use sin and you use things that exist in a fallen world in order to accomplish your perfect purpose. And that gives us hope and confidence and joy in a time when there is much in our world that seems to be uncertain. Lord, we'd, we look at the situation around us. We may have ideas for how things could be made better, or we may find ourselves uh, just shaking our heads and thinking that uh, we don't even really know what the answer is, but the good news is we can trust in you and we can know that you are sovereign and that you will bring good uh, through all of the circumstances that our world is facing right now. And you will make us better. You will equip us 
and you will grow us as a result of the things that you allow us to go through in your sovereignty and your wisdom. We do pray that you would be gracious to our nation during this time of political unrest. We thank you that you have had your hand upon our process and the degree to which we have not experienced the unrest and the violence that perhaps uh, we might have anticipated coming into this last uh, election season. But Lord, we certainly do pray that you would work in your sovereign way, that you would uh, raise up the leaders that you desire us to have, and we ask that you would cause us to be a witness for Christ as we interact with those around us, that we would show by our, our lives, that we would show by our words and by our tone that we have a higher hope than this world and we have a higher hope even than this nation. Lord, as grateful as we are for it, we realize that ultimately our hope is in you and our citizenship is in heaven. And we pray that you would help us to rejoice and take confidence in that this morning. This morning, it's our joy to lift up to you our missionaries to Papua New Guinea, Jeremy and Carolyn Dion. We thank you for the good ministry that they've already been able to engage in, even though they're still relatively new to the field. We ask that you would pave the way for them to be able to make a smooth transition back to PNG here shortly. We ask that you would continue to help Jeremy to experience progress in the healing of his hand. And we would certainly ask that you would give uh, their family ministry opportunities, both in PNG and here in the States in the meantime. We thank you for this discipleship opportunity that Jeremy has with Michael. We pray that you would help that to be effective in Michael's spiritual life and growth. And then we also praise you for the birth of their fourth child, for the birth of Hudson Lee. We thank you for your grace uh, in that way to this family, and we pray that you would continue to, uh, to help the, ch uh, the children of the Dion family to grow in their walk with you, and we pray that they would in time become effective servants for you in the place where you have called their family to serve. Father, we thank you for the ways in which you are working, in our, many in our congregation who are struggling physically. Uh, we thank you for sustaining uh, Ann and Carrie in their fight with COVID. We thank you for um, the way that you have protected so many of us in the midst of what is clear, clearly an uns, uncertain situation surrounding us. We ask that you would continue to provide protection, that you would give our church leaders wisdom as they make decisions about the best way to respond uh, to COVID and the progress that it's making in our community. And then we would also ask this morning, Father, that you would continue to shower on the Lundberg family. We thank you for the, uh, the slight progress that we've um, been blessed to hear about here later uh, this last week. We ask that you would continue to strengthen Cindy, that you would help her body to begin to function again. And we ask that you would give her the spiritual strength and the emotional strength that she needs for this very difficult time. Please encourage her family as well, Lord, as they strive to minister to her, those who are able to be with her and those who are not but wish they could be. We pray that you would lift up their spirits during this time, and we pray that you would give them the peace that passes all understanding. We thank you for your providence and the life of the Calgar family. And Lord, even as uh, we mourn uh, the homegoing of, of John's father, we thank you for your mercy and uh, in taking him home to yourself in what was certainly not going to be a, an easy situation for the long term. We do pray, though, that you would bring comfort uh, to the hearts of that family and that you would um, cause, cause hearts to be turned to Christ as a result of the, the sorrow that that family is experiencing at this time. We praise you for the successful surgery that Darrell had on Friday. We ask that you would uh, continue to give him a good recovery and ask that you would bless him with uh, good results and improved hearing as a result of that surgery that he had on Friday. And then, Lord, we pray for any others uh, that we may know in our congregation that are struggling with COVID. We realize that this affects many of us uh, in different areas of our lives. We pray that you would uh, be gracious to Jack, this friend of the Wasson family. We pray that you would bring healing to his body, and we pray that you would turn his heart and his attention to Christ in a very unique and special way during this time. Then, Father, as we give our gifts to you this morning, we are mindful of the fact that we owe you everything, so we pray that you would help us to give not with a sense of duty or obligation, but we pray that you would help us to give out of hearts that are full and overwhelmed with joy uh, at what you have done for us. We pray that you would use our gifts, that you would give us as the church wisdom in how we use them, and we pray that they would be effective in expanding the reach of, our, of this ministry and your kingdom in our community around this world. We pray your blessing on this offering, and we pray your blessing on the remainder of this service. May Christ be honored and lifted up in all that is said and done here, and we ask these things in his name. Amen.
Well, we have another new song this morning. Oh, well, that's surprising. God moves in a mysterious way. Uh, I'm going to have Pastor play through this once. He'll play through a verse and a chorus. So bear in mind uh, the verses repeat before choruses. Just follow along. It'll be fine. So he's going to play through that once, and then we'll get started.
Amen. Very good singing. Our final hymn before the service. Rejoice, the Lord is King. I'll invite you to stand with me as we sing Rejoice, the Lord is King. I have 
We are returning once again to our study of Matthew's gospel, so I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Does anyone remember what our topic is in Matthew chapter 13? We're talking about parables, right? And those parables are unified by a particular theme that actually was at the center of Jesus' preaching ministry. Um, and it's important for us to notice this as we study the Gospels. Jesus was not preaching random messages that didn't really all fit together to form one large idea. The main message that he was preaching that we've already seen in the Gospel of Matthew is the message of the kingdom, the Gospel of the kingdom. And so when we come to chapter 13, Jesus is continuing what he has been doing all along. He's teaching us about the nature of the kingdom. But the vehicle that he's using to do that is parables. Now, as we've said before, people often think of parables as sermon illustrations. And there's a sense in which there, there, there are some similarities there. But Jesus' purpose in using parables was not necessarily the same purpose that preachers have in using illustrations. In fact, Jesus makes it clear that the reason he used parables was because there were some people who were blind. There were people who would not hear and because of Jesus' teaching in parables, that ensured that they would not hear and that they would not see the truth. It's kind of a counterintuitive approach to us. We automatically assume that for any preacher, the, the greatest mark of success is that you will get the greatest number of people to respond to your message. The problem is when we see people responding to Jesus in large numbers during his earthly ministry, were they doing so for the right reasons? No, no. Uh, for instance, in John chapter 6, Jesus, Jesus points out that you guys are just following me because of the bread, right? You see, you see the loaves, and you, and, and, and you, and you want to have the benefit of, of my ministry. And of course, Jesus was not here in order to give people what they wanted. He was here in order to give people what they truly needed. But the fact that Jesus spoke in parables, in part in order to conceal truth from those that really weren't interested in hearing the truth, poses a bit of a problem for us, Right? Because we need Jesus' explanation in order to fully understand the truth that he's conveying to us through these parables. And the last several messages in this series, we have benefited from the explanation that Jesus gave to his disciples, haven't we? Because we read the parable, and then what do we do? We see the explanation that Jesus gives to his disciples when they ask him about the meaning of the parable a short time later. Well, the problem is we don't have that divine explanation for all the parables, so we're going, we're going to have to do our best to make sense of the parables that we have before us this morning um, in, in a large degree without the benefit of the kind of explanation that we've had for the last several parables. And I have very creatively titled the message this morning, Five More Kingdom Parables, simply because uh, any one of these parables are a, little bit, are a little bit short to get a full message out of, and frankly, I there's a part of me that wants to keep on moving through Matthew's gospel so we don't feel like we're bogged down and we're not making any progress. But I think that we will see some common themes arising out of these parables um, as, we've, as we finish them up in Matthew 13 this morning. So let's look as we begin at the parable of the mustard seed. And we see this in verses 31 and 32. Verses 31 and 32. He put another parable before them, saying, 
the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, as we have seen before, there are, of course, parallel verses, that parallel passages that we could look at. We're not going to take the time to delve into those this morning, but if you're interested, you could look over at Mark 4 or Luke 13 to see uh, other places where Jesus uses this parable. And actually, this parable is going to go together really well with the next one that we're going to see. So I'm going to go ahead right now and read the next one so we can see how they tie together in the spiritual point that Jesus is making in these parables. So moving on to verse 33, it says, He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. You see how those two parables go together? Is there a point of comparison between these two parables? One of the things that we want to be careful about when we interpret parables is not assuming that a parable equals an allegory. You may be familiar with the meaning of allegory from your high school literature class, or you may have completely forgotten about that. But what is an allegory? Well, the classic illustration of an allegory is the Pilgrim's Progress, right? And in that story, every character in every place has a symbolic meaning that means something important that you don't want to overlook. And we don't want to interpret the parables in that way because there really is generally a single main point of comparison that Jesus is making. And if Jesus gives an explanation, you can, you can often see what the significance of that point is. So what is it that these two parables have in common? Well, you start with something that's not very noticeable. You start with something that's fairly small. It doesn't look like it's going to have a tremendous impact. But what is the end of that thing in each of those parables? There, there is a great result. There is a surprising result. Maybe it's not surprising to you if you're a gardener and you're used to seeing seeds turn into something bigger and more impressive than what you originally planted early in the spring. But the point that Jesus is making is that this is the way the kingdom of God operates. It operates like something that starts small, almost imperceptible. And then in time, there is a great transformation that takes place. Of course, this is not the first time that Jesus has used agriculture in order to teach spiritual truth. We've also seen other places, in, even in this chapter, where Jesus has done that, right? He talks about the sower and the seed, um, and he talks about the parable of the weeds. We mentioned that a couple weeks ago. Do you think that we should connect all of these parables to each other? That's, that, that's, a, that's a natural tendency that we have when we're reading through our Bibles and we see themes that appear to be common themes coming up again and again. The only trouble I think that you run into is that sometimes it doesn't necessarily seem to line up. So, for instance, what do you make of the birds of the air that come and make, make nests in the branches of this plant? Well, does anybody remember what the birds were in the parable of the soils? What, 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 what were the birds? Yeah, this is, this, this is, this is not a good thing. And in that case, and so we want to be careful, I think, about taking all of the symbolism or all of the points of comparison from all the other parables and making them all mean the same thing. I think we need to take these parables kind of as standalone units so we don't end up importing meaning that's not necessarily there. The main point that Jesus seems to be making is that you have this imperceptible growth from something that is not very big, that doesn't seem to be very significant, but over time, it becomes very significant. And actually, it makes a lot of sense that Jesus speaks of the kingdom in these terms because there are a number of places in the Old Testament where kingdoms or, or kings are described in terms of trees and trees that birds would come and rest upon. You remember in Daniel when that, when that illustration, when that comparison is used of King Nebuchadnezzar where Daniel describes Nebuchadnezzar in that way? Uh, I think that that's perhaps a, an idea that Jesus is drawing upon when he is describing a kingdom and its growth in terms of a tree or a plant. Now, you could, of course, be critical of what Jesus is saying here if you have a mind to be. Um, you might say, well, we have discovered smaller seeds than the mustard seed. Does that undo what Jesus is saying here? Of course it doesn't. We understand that Jesus is not speaking in absolute scientific terms here. He knows the largest seeds and the smallest seeds. He created them. He's not taken by surprise when it comes, when it comes to the nature of the different seeds. 
But the point is that of, of the various seeds that these people were used to using and handling, this was a small seed, and yet there was spectacular growth that came of it. And so Jesus is showing us that the beginnings of the kingdom can be almost imperceptible, but its long-term impact is stunning. Is there an application for us from that principle? I think there is. I think that we shouldn't be disheartened when we see what looks like a lack of spiritual growth. When the kingdom of God does not seem to be progressing, when it seems like the church is losing ground in the culture, we should remember that God is doing great things in small places and in small ways. Not necessarily ways that the world will immediately notice around us. The, oftentimes, the most important things that are happening in our country never make it to the major news media. And so if all we are ever doing is looking at things from the world's perspective, then we're gonna reach the conclusion that God is done with the church, God is done with his people because it just looks like we are losing ground everywhere. But God is continuing to work and his kingdom will not fail. His kingdom is forever. And that is the confidence that we have that Jesus is illustrating in this way. Of course, the next parable, as I've already suggested, it really, it really reinforces this theme where he's talking about the kingdom of heaven in terms of leaven. Once again, this is a place where we want to be careful about importing our usual understanding of a word into the meaning of this particular parable. In Scripture, is leaven a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, generally it's a bad thing, right? And we have, we have been taught, perhaps since the time that we were young, that, uh, that leaven is symbolic of sin and impurity and that it's something that you need to um, separate from because of that. But in this case, what is it that the leaven is illustrating? Again, it's illustrating the kingdom of heaven, right? It's illustrating, I think, the growth of the kingdom. And so in this case, it's a very good thing because it's showing that you have something that is very small and that works slowly, but in time, it has a significant effect on, this, on the situation around it. That seems to be what Jesus is getting at here. And as we, th as we think about the nature of the growth of the kingdom, we, we, can, we can be very encouraged by Jesus' teaching in these parables this morning. This is not a long passage. Jesus d doesn't give us very detailed explanation. We might be interested to know a little bit more detail about what Jesus means when he talks about the birds of the air that are coming and building branches uh, or, or building nests in the branches. We might be interested to know a little bit more about the symbolism that Jesus may have had in mind in these short parables. But if you focus on the main idea, the fact that the kingdom of God is growing, and it starts from something small. It starts from something that people tend to discount, and then it becomes something stunning, and it has an impact on the world around it. There is great encouragement for us in a passage like this. And I, I'm struck oftentimes as I hear people talking about the state of the church. There, there are some people that do a good job of maintaining a balance in their perspective about the church, the world, current events. But sometimes I hear people that are so critical of the church and so critical of Christians Sometimes young people can be this way, right? So they, they become teenagers and they, then they know everything. And then maybe they go off to school, maybe they go off to even a Christian college and then they start to learn some things and what do they start to do? They start to look back on their childhood, they look back on their parents, they look back on their church with disgust, right? How can these, how can these people not know all the things that I know? How can they not understand all of the things that I understand? You often hear people speaking almost as though if it weren't for all the stupid Christians, our world would be a perfect place, right? That's, that, that is the way I think our culture sometimes seems to think, the way our media seems to view us as Christians. And I don't, and I don't, I don't wanna get to the, into this morning the, the, uh, the, the worthiness of that kind of an argument or that kind of a perspective, but I just wanna point out the fact that sometimes people are thinking about what God is doing in this world on the wrong level. They are, miss, they are missing the things that God is doing because they are focusing on what they think God should be doing. Is that not exactly what the Jews did during Jesus' earthly ministry? They had Jesus' agenda all planned out for him. They knew exactly what he was supposed to come and do. He was going, he was going to assume the throne, he was going to overthrow the Roman Empire, and he was going to introduce the kingdom and exalt Israel to a place of leadership among the nations. That was their plan for Jesus. That was not Jesus' plan for himself. And we need to rest in the fact that Jesus is in control and he has a plan this morning, even if it doesn't necessarily look like the plan that you or I might come up with for him. Oftentimes when people look at the church in our day, they are not measuring it with the right ruler. They are not evaluating the, the church with the right criteria. 
They don't see families that are raising godly, responsible children. They don't see church members that are faithfully loving and caring for and encouraging and discipling one another. They don't see people who are giving of their money, giving of their time sacrificially in order to make a difference in their community and in order to right the wrongs of our society. They don't see people who are giving their hearts day by day to Christ to pursue him and to become more like him. Those are, those are not things that the world around us notices. And yet those are the things that transform the church. And those are the things that make us impactful to the world around us. The ordinary Christian life over time is incredibly transformational. Do not discount what God is able to do through an ordinary life that is lived faithfully for the Lord. You can be encouraged by that this morning uh, if it feels like the church is losing its visible influence around us. If you have reason to be encouraged by the growth in your life, in your heart, then you can be encouraged because God's kingdom is growing as God is working through you in small and even imperceptible ways. Well, that brings us then to verse 44. I'll invite your attention now there. We are jumping down, of course, because we've already talked about the parable of the weeds. That explanation goes with the parable that Jesus had given earlier. But in verse 44, Jesus moves in a new direction, and he says, the kingdom of heaven now is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And I'm gonna move right on to verse 45, because once again, these two parables seem to be making a very similar point. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, these two parables focus on individual people who are affected by the kingdom. And you might sort of imagine by the, by the picture that Jesus is painting here that this is somebody who just happens upon a great treasure. When you were a child, did you ever go searching for treasure? Did you ever find any? It, does, it doesn't very often happen that you find any, any treasure. I, I remember one time when I was a kid and our family, we were going swimming at a small lake up north. And for whatever reason, I decided it would be a good idea to just dig a hole. So there was, there was a sand, sandy beach and I just started digging down for no particular reason, just to see what was there. And I, once, once I'd gotten down probably about a couple of feet, uh, I found an old buffalo nickel. And I thought that was the coolest thing as a kid, because you never actually expect to find anything, and then every once in a while, you find, yourself, uh, you find yourself something that you weren't expecting to find. And you can imagine what that would be like on a much more significant, a much more incredible level. So some of my, some of my grammar and literature students this year, they spent some time reading Part of Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. And you can imagine how you would feel if all of a sudden you came upon Captain Flint's treasure trove. How excited would you be? You would, you would, of course, you would, of course, be thrilled with that discovery, and that's the, that's the same kind of emotion we see in the, in a passage like this. This is not somebody who's just thinking, "Oh, I guess this this will make my life better." This is somebody who is filled with joy, with so much joy that he, you see, in verse forty four, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. He knows what he is getting is so much better than anything else that he currently has. He's willing to trade all of it in order to receive what he has now discovered. Same thing happens in this parable of the pearl of great price. It's like a merchant in search of fine pearls. He has pearls, he, has, he already has valuables, but finding one pearl of great price, he goes and he sells all that he has in order to buy that one great pearl. Have you ever experienced the gospel in that way? Have you experienced the message of salvation through Jesus Christ to be more valuable, to be more important to you than anything else in this world? Like you'd be, actually be willing to give up everything that you have in order to experience that and to have that treasure, that is somebody who understands the significance of the gospel message. And sometimes I think we as Christians lose sight of what we have been given. We forget just how great a treasure we possess in Christ and we possess in our salvation. And a passage like this that reminds us of our first experience of knowing the Lord and our salvation, it calls us back to view the kingdom in that way and to reorient our priorities that get out of line as we go through our lives, we get distracted by things in this world. It happens to all of us. But we need to remember that what we have been given in Christ is so much better than anything else that we could possibly have in this life. So let's not let the things in this life hold us back from serving the Lord the way that he calls us to do. This kind of perspective on life is what allows Christians to be radically faithful in a world that is not altogether that friendly to Christians. What is it that we remember Jim Elliott for saying as, as, 
as kind of a summary of his philosophy of life. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That is our perspective on life as Christians. There is nothing that we are afraid to give up because we know that eventually all of this thing, the things in this world, they will be taken away from us. They are only temporary, but in Christ we have what is eternal and far more valuable than those other things that people around us choose to live for. If you have never seen Christ in that way, if you have never come to know Christ as your Savior, my encouragement to you this morning is to recognize that what you can have through him is so much better than anything else that you are currently living for, anything else that you think that you can get out of this world, any of the other hopes and dreams that you may have created for yourself. You should be willing to trade those in order to experience and receive Christ. He will be far better, and he is going to be far more lasting and permanent than any of those things. And if we recognize that as Christians, that's going to affect the way we present the gospel, isn't it? Do you ever find yourself sharing the gospel with unsaved people, almost expecting that, you know what? They're really not gonna think it's that great. They're really not going to think it's worth giving up all the other things that they're living for in order to receive Christ. I think that that has been the case in many progressive churches, churches that have abandoned the authority of scripture in, in many areas um, of lifestyle that our culture has cur is currently shifting on. For instance, we think about LGBTQ issues. These are a huge issue in our culture. And there are some churches, I think, that literally feel that Christ is not better than the lifestyle those people desire for themselves. Therefore, they are willing to compromise what the Bible teaches about Christ and the gospel in order to affirm those people in what they are living for. Do we look at the gospel that way? Do we think that the gospel is not actually better than the things that people in this world live for. I hope that's not the case. But let's knowing, knowing the value of the gospel message, knowing the value of our relationship with Christ, let's be open and let's be frank with the world around us about what God is calling people to, and let's trust that by God's grace, some of them are gonna have the eyes to see it. And they are going to accept that even if it comes at what looks like is a great personal cost. David Martin Lloyd-Jones was a well-known preacher in the 20th century. He preached um, in the Metropolitan, um, uh, or he preached um, at the Westminster Chapel in London, and he was often, he was often um, addressed about the matter of his ministry because before he became a pastor, before he became a Christian, he was on track to become a physician. Um, he was actually an assistant to the royal physician in, in England. And so he was ministering to all of these incredibly powerful and wealthy people. This was about the most influential position he could have had pursuing medicine. And yet when people, people asked him, well, how could you give that up in order to pursue the gospel? His response was, I didn't give up anything. What I, what I have been given, the calling that I have been given to pursue is so much greater and so much, so much more important than anything that I was living for before I surrendered to that call. That really is the perspective that we as Christians should have on our service for the Lord. Well, that brings us finally then to verses 47 through 50. I'll, I'll direct your attention to those verses as we look at the parable of the net. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you follow the significance of that parable? Does it make sense to you? I think there's, there's a little bit more explanation that Jesus gives here, so that certainly is helpful to us. But of course, you understand that fishing in the, in the day and age that Jesus was speaking was a little bit different than the kind of fishing that you're probably used to. You're generally probably pretty selective in the fish that you go after, and the means that you use to catch them is selective, right? You can only probably catch about one or two at a time. But when you're, when you're fishing with a net, you never know what you're gonna catch. You never know what's gonna be brought in. And the point is that at the end of that, that day of fishing, there's going to be a sorting process and not everything is going to go to the same place. What is coming in the day of judgment? There will be a great sorting process. There are some people that will be kept that the Lord will keep as his. There are others who will be cast out into eternal judgment, into the fiery furnace. And in that place, Jesus says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It'll be too late at that point to make a different choice. But you have the ability to make that choice now, today, do you not? 
If you, if you have not placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, now is the day of salvation. This is the day that God wants you to repent of your sin and to place your faith in Jesus Christ. If you do that, then what is going to happen when everything begins to crumble in this world and experiences God's judgment? What is going to happen to you? God will keep you. He will preserve you. He will give you his eternal life. And that is the hope that you and I are looking forward to. And we can rejoice in that, even when it looks like things aren't going our way right now in our world. In many ways, perhaps they're not. But we are on the right side. And in the end, that is all that is going to matter. So if you have never put your faith and trust in Christ, may I encourage you to do that this morning. It will eventually be too late, but it is not too late today. So may we, may we all be enabled by God to make that right choice and to put our trust and our faith in him as our savior this morning. And as we conclude the service this morning, I'd like us to, think, to sing what we think of as a great thanksgiving hymn. Come ye thankful people, come. But this proves to not only be a hymn of thanksgiving, it's a hymn that teaches us, that reminds us of the fact that God is going to one day judge this world. And, though, and those who are his, he will take into, into his barn, he will preserve them, but those who are not his, they will, they will be thrown into everlasting destruction, into the judgment of hell. And so these are serious things that we're talking about this morning. There, is, there are eternal stakes in these truths that Jesus has taught us. So may the Lord give us the grace to see that as we affirm those truths by our singing as we close the service. Let's go ahead and stand together as we sing our final hymn. Thanks. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us, how you demonstrated that when you sent your son to die for our sins. Father, now is your wheat 
in this world. Father, we find ourselves as your instruments to spread the gospel. Lord, you've given us this word of encouragement, this word, Lord, that tells the world that their sins can be forgiven. Father, we are to be focused as your children on the spreading of the gospel wherever we go. Help us to be a living witness for you so that others may see Christ through us and know that you are the God of the harvest and that you will send the reapers just as you've sent the witnesses. Lord, help us to fulfill the great commission to be your witnesses in this world. Thank you again for the opportunity to share with each other, to be here in fellowship, to be encouraged and challenged through your word. Now bring us back this evening, rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.